Welcome data enthusiasts. We are Zuma, the recruitment agency focused 100% on data tech professionals in the Berlin region. And this is our podcast, Data for Good, connecting you with all things data. Today, I'm joined by Nanette Swed. Nanette is co-founder and CEO of Humanize. That's H-U-M-A-N-A-I-Z-E. And Humanize is a product shop for empathetic AI agents. Nanette, how is it going with you today? <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me here, uh, Joseph. It's, uh, yeah, I, everything is going fine. I'm looking forward to our conversation. <laughs> Great. I'm looking forward to going into your topic of passion and expertise. And I understand that topic today for us to talk about is empathetic AI. Exactly. And what it can do for humanity. <laughs> Excellent. Oof, they, yeah. they are bold claims. <laughs> Super. Um, so Nanette, tell me and tell us data enthusiasts, what is high level? What is empathetic AI? Oh yeah, okay. You're diving. You're starting with a with a big question already. I mean, empathetic AI, uh, as as powered by natural language processing, refers really to artificial intelligence systems that are designed to understand and respond to human emotions uh, appropriately. Uh, in in a way, ideally, that is uh, contextually appropriate as well. So. Um, what we aim to do with empathetic AI is to create engaging uh, interactions between humans and machines, really. Super. Uh, and okay, what what context are most people using empathetic AI in? I mean, um, so far, I mean, this is definitely an area that is still to be developed or where a lot of development uh, is happening right now. Um, we are mostly putting it in places where human interaction fails. <laughs> There's too little uh, conversation, too little humans looking after humans. Uh, that can be in many areas. It can be in the health uh, sector. It can be in the customer service that is happening at work every day that human interaction fails. Um, so recently we have built an open access AI that people can consult with uh, through our web app about all subjects around um, feelings of being bullied or discriminated or harassed or just pushed aside at work. So all the topics that people might feel uncomfortable with speaking out at work, um, especially in the settings of remote work that I don't really know my colleagues too well, um, but still have the feeling, okay, there's something that is off, something I don't like that's going against me and I can't really get, get to it people usually don't have a place where to vent and let this out and they don't have a place where if behavior is really unjust and that mm. there's a, a, like a strong case of misconduct happening that they can fix it easily or quickly without opening up on the situation to their HR manager or whoever the responsible person in their uh, place of work would be. So mm. in order to enable people to open up uh, we saw that there's a huge gap of communication uh, that we can fill in with an empathetic AI that is an anonymous place where people can feel safe about sharing things that they wouldn't dare to share with people. Super. Well, uh, sorry, the potential is super. It's addressing a real need and a problem quite clearly. And yeah, I see you've said healthcare and, and even the customer service domain. Did you mention that? Yeah, that might be. But touch uh, upon that real quickly. I mean, customer service, you know, when I'm uh, calling customer service lines, I either have really a, a bad bot <laughs> that is telling me which numbers to click and then I'm waiting, I'm clicking a two 
and then I'm waiting five more minutes till I'm getting kicked off the line because sorry, the line is too busy. Call us in a later point of time. So that kind of really frustrating uh, experiences that you will have when you're calling in, in in customer service lines where they have these really bad bots. Imagine how this mm. bot could talk just like a person. And you would get through with your questions and your questions would get answered and you would be happy as if you had spoken to a human, um, taking into account that maybe, you know, sometimes when people, when customers, they have a problem, they sometimes lose their temper. They sometimes use maybe a little uh, unpolite tone when they face the customer care agents. So the machine has the advantage that it takes us the emotion, but it's still programmed and cool and doesn't have emotions by itself. So it can easily respond in a very polite way. It doesn't cost the machine as much as it costs me as a human to stay polite when someone isn't polite to, to me. Um, so there are many uh, use cases that, that are there for empathetic AI. Mm, certainly. Yeah, I, and, I, and I get the domain with customer services. Uh, I didn't, I, I suppose, I, mental health comes into many interactions, doesn't it? You, you were talking about the workplace and people being able to talk freely about things they wouldn't be able to with their boss or their colleagues. But yeah. that mental health also goes over to commercial to commercial situations or customer service situations or purchasing Definitely. or support. Um, yeah. It's wonderful to think that these machine learning models are evolving as the engineers who make them are getting stronger, the machines are getting stronger. Yeah. Um, and I also see um, remote working being commonplace now globally and universally uh, across industries. And, and then also the next generation of humans, Gen Zers are much more glued to their phones and glued to tech rather than they are to humans so this it is a way of kind of breaking down that wall and, and reaching out to them it, it is the younger generation particularly a target of yours not at this moment uh i'm <laughs> fantasizing about something because um i what always hurts me is to see how kids uh, get hurt at school from Hello, kids <laughs> from classmates. Um, how, you know, um, building friendships is often run on the cost of particular individuals who get marginalized, so who are excluded from that group. So that kind of grouping dynamics that humans have for some reason that they need to feel the belonging in order to feeling belonging, there's an exclusion happening from other people. So I have seen this when I grew up in school. Um, I was certainly also on some point part of this kind of group, excluding certain kids. And, uh, and, and I'm seeing it now as a parent, how this is happening again through my kids' generation. And, and it breaks my heart because I know now with the perspective of an adult where this can go and how people get scarred for their lives um, mm. when when they are facing this kind of discrimination against them uh, personally. So I would really love to go there. I would really lo love to provide an empathetic AI that is there for those kind of kids mm. that feel, and it's it's potentially everybody because everybody got, got hurt from friends or other classmates at one point. So it can be all of us. I don't say that there's just a few victims say, like it's uh, basically where in one point, each of us is not behaving nice. And it's always great to have a place to go and talk to. And I see that very often kids don't have the relationship with their parents to discuss about things that because they feel ashamed or they don't want the mom to worry too much. Or there's so many reasons why uh, humans don't open up to humans. And it's really nice to have like this, this, uh, warm energy and this uh mm. empathetic i'm here for you whatever it is i'm always your friend um 
mm-hmm. also for kids. Yeah, I would love to do this. I ha- we haven't done it yet. <laughs> no, no. The Tamagotchi. Do you remember this? This little. I do. I do. I do. <laughs> that, that I do. A... I didn't. I didn't have one though. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, that was a, a funny mental health. Um... Uh huh tool that comes to my mind um uh, on a serious note then uh, how yeah. do you see ai impacting healthcare in the future i am um, if if it's not impolite for me to say i don't believe empathetic ai is commonplace or that widespread now the preferred mm-hmm. solution is is healthcare physical healthcare from hospitals or uh you know gp or uh, practice you know healthcare practitioners how do you see yeah. AI impacting healthcare in the future? I mean, this is a vast field. There's a lot of AI that I don't feel uh, specialist enough to talk a bit about. Uh, talk about it. So when it comes to um, uh, artificial used uh, to recognize certain patterns and images, like which is uh, super important for diagnosing cancer, for example, really early on. That is not my my field of expertise, but I think this is super important for us, uh, for everyone that is affected by these kind of diseases or uh, neurological diseases to see um, changes in the brain really early on through scans and AI can detect things that uh, the even the trained medical eye doesn't see um, as early on. So that's, this is great advancement that uh, thanks to AI, we enjoy and we will enjoy them more in the future. Um, machines being um, controlled better and there's a lot of this going on when it comes to conversational AI, generative, generative AI, conversational AI that is able to build a more empathetic healthcare around the patient. I also see a lot of potential, I think, this is an area which is widely untouched. Um, so I think there's a lot of space to uh, increase the the understanding communication between the medical staff and the patient. So I've, I don't know whether you've come across this, but every time I'm going to a doctor, I either I don't get an appointment at all because they're all booked. <laughs> or I get, or I'm going without appointment, then I wait forever. And then I have like two minutes to be in the doctor's room and get diagnosed and sent home with a certain treatment or whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And when I'm leaving the place, I'm always thinking, okay, I actually forgot to make like these two questions because I feel, okay, I know he doesn't have time for me. He doesn't even look up from the screen. He never looked into my face. He's giving me all the signs. Don't eat my time. I see Mm -hmm. what you have. You get the medicine and you leave now. (laughs) So all this, again, not existing communication is something that we, I mean, in the first place, we should try to be there as human, but given the system as it is right now, we can maybe try to, um, yeah, bridge it with AI mm-hmm. that can give further explanation on the case. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, you know, it's a strong message from a doctor, and I have experienced it where the doctor doesn't look up, they're very short, very direct. And even in the UK, I've seen they do um, healthcare appointments or doctor's appointment via video. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, we, we understand that um, AI, the the limits of, or it seems uh, limitless as to what AI could do with analysis of speech and facial expressions. So those same doctor's appointment via video could be mm-hmm. uh, with an AI assistant or an AI doctor, dare I say. Okay. Yeah. What 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 makes you think that in the future, and I, I'm not doubting it, but what makes you think in the future that empathetic AI will be the preferred solution for the modern world? Over human interaction, you mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, 
First of all, let me say, I mean, I'm running a company that is developing a, uh, empathetic AI agents. Uh, let me say, I still hope that the human interaction will be the preferred one. And I believe that human interaction will be the preferred one. But as we see, there are certain gaps that humans just are not able to fill. Uh, willing mm -hmm. to fill also when it comes to taking care of elderly people. I see uh, my mom's neighbor, he's living alone and he's getting his food like twice a day uh, and this person coming has a tight schedule he has to run between villages with a car he's in his house exactly two minutes exactly two minutes so th this old man he's by himself basically 24 hours minus four minutes <laughs> each day so um the reason why I believe that there's a lot of potential uh, for empathetic AI to make our world better is because I see so much failure, so much non-assistant uh, uh, human need, human needs uh, that need to be fulfilled somehow. And empathetic AI is one way to bridge the gap and then maybe try to connect him with another person who is actually looking for someone to give joy and company to, because we have those people too in society. And it's really a good idea to use AI to connect people faster. Uh, this is also something, by the way, that we're doing with Hope, uh, which is the open access empathetic AI that you can anonymously talk about a sensitive topic. So Hope is not there to substitute humans to make them um, uh, superfluous in our lives. It's actually the opposite. In the end of this uh, conversation that you have with Hope, it's most likely that Hope will ask you whether you want to be put in touch with a certain person that could help you out, like a real human. Mm. So. so it's the first, uh, the first touch point. Is an AI, because sometimes yeah. it's just easier to open up anonymously <laughs> to safe space where there's no judgment right yeah well it, it could um make the situation more um uh, could optimize the situation so that people aren't spending time with the wrong person early on when an a uh, an ai an empathetic ai assistant uh could uh, direct them the, uh, in into the right direction i'm tongue-tied today sorry yeah. Um, okay, it, could you list to me then, in short, some of the major benefits of empathetic AI? We've talked about mm. a few today already, particularly with the freeing up of time, yeah, the understanding of of, of emotions. Exactly. Um, so, okay, it has. I mean, in in human empathy, we have two say two two ways of how to read empathy or two two strands there the one is the cognitive so the understanding um so i see a person's emotion i understand what it is i give it an interpretation and i react in an appropriate way um this is what ai can do too so i would say this is on a plus side so it can recognize and uh, understand emotions and it can react uh, in a way that is appropriate to this particular emotion and also given a certain context because an emotion in different contexts might be addressed uh, with different different answers so i would say that's a benefit <laughs> um i mean obviously because ai doesn't have emotion and this consciousness uh, it is less prone to react in an overly emotional way. This is the example that I was giving uh, uh, with the example of a custom, potential customer care board that, that just doesn't react uh, in a negative way on people insulting or, you know, becoming a little bit more aggressive. More, more rational. Yeah. yeah. Ra well, rational. <laughs> yeah, ratio is, uh, I would say ratio is something human, but you know, it's a programmatic a simulation of being nice and keeping it cool. Um, it's, you know, going to all the places, you can implement it in all the places, again, that humans are absent. 
So it could be installed in those places where human humans are missing for whatever reason, because it's night, you know, people used to sleep in the night or usually sleep at night or um, because our healthcare uh, insurances, <laughs> healthcare institutions don't invest enough of money to have uh, professional caretakers to take care of us. So uh, that's, that's a big advantage that I see. You don't have judgment from AI, right? So it doesn't judge you about the way you think. It doesn't judge you about the way you speak or about things that you don't know or don't understand yet or quickly enough. So that is, um, that is the reason why many people like to talk to our AI agents also at work because they can, for example, ask tell me what is our policy on this and this and where do I find this document and no one will roll the eye and say oh, it's written in the conference you should know this <laughs> or why are all the people asking me the same question over and over again now AI doesn't care whether you ask this question 20 times 50 times it doesn't care and it will not tell you listen it's in the confluence and you could have looked it up and spared me this five minutes that you just ate uh, for my time because yeah. so it could serve to be the internal uh company wiki on exactly. all this information is, yeah this is what we're doing already so we are apart from hope we also have um empathetic ai which is implemented in some of our customers uh company communication channels so people can for example talk to it through slack and uh talk about i mean things in general uh but they can uh, what people do with chat gpt but that this um this ai would also know about the company so whatever task they want to perform it is already trained with the knowledge from the company and can perform the task faster and better you don't have to do all this difficult prompting that also eats your time uh, and it knows where your stuff is, right? So how many mm. times I'm looking for information, where was this file? And then I'm going through the, the folders. Mm. And now that we're connecting it to our AI, it's like all of a sudden it's uh, going through our Notion pages and giving me just the information right away. It's like I have this always kind angel being there giving me always the right answer. And I don't have to struggle and look for it. And I don't have to feel stupid to ask it ask for it because i should know where it is yeah fantastic it feels like the um the benefits and advantages are limitless but yep. how about the limitations limitations well obviously you have to be very careful uh where you put your data and what you do with your data um so data security and uh, the protection of personal data is obviously a subject that you have to deal with if you implement such an AI system within the workspace. So uh, that is something that we are uh, working really carefully on. Um, and I would say apart from this uh, factor, which is a big one, Obviously, AI cannot give you a hug, you know, it's nothing that you can drink a coffee with. It cannot meet you in in front of the coffee machine and look you into the eye. That's mm. the limitation, really, uh, mm. that I see, which is why we use AI to create this moment of human meeting and looking themselves into the eyes. And mm. yeah. Well, yeah. Do, do you see any concerns with accuracy? Or are we beyond that now? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, there's so many things. There's also the critique of bias in AI, uh, but the sense of accuracy, definitely, this is something that you have to also have to uh, zoom into, right? But to be honest, also in the interaction with humans, <laughs> so many yeah, things that, that yeah, I see on the negative side of AI that I see often listed on the negative side of AI, I'm thinking, Okay, but you know, uh, in terms of accuracy, when I talk to people, I so often get exaggerated information or or mispresented information where or, or the their, their their perspective only. Yes, so everything presented through a lens of their own perception, and then it is like in a completely different picture, as if the whole context would have been supported, or uh, yeah. 
So yes, <laughs> but because we're okay. kind of comparing this to the human, uh, I, I see this is a, a point that both sides need to be careful about. Mm -hmm. It's like the um, self-driving vehicles. Um, if there's ever a crash with a self-driving vehicle, we, you know, we we are exasperated and furious, but the chance of uh, in dangerous situations or crashes or incidents in uh, autonomous vehicles is is a fraction of uh, of that with of those with humans. So yeah, just way more critical of um, uh, yeah. machine learning based uh, products. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you see the future of either your product or empathetic AI generally? How do you see it evolving? Well, I think that, uh, you know, with the younger generation becoming much more active in, in the work space <laughs> and, uh, um, seeing them interacting with AI already as compared to like older generations, I think it would be pretty much our natural to interact with AI and also empathetic AI on a daily basis. I think it would be pretty normal. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Super. I, I um, uh, as a side note, I have worked with a coach in the past and still do, but I've also now started to work with a AI coach, uh, nice. which seems, yeah, it seems really novel right now but still mm -hmm. the the impact is the same um so yeah okay. I, I have faith in the field I, I think it just takes time for people to uh to believe it to see it to believe it to to use it how, how i have could no the... question about it but but are you content already with the answers you get or with the experience that you get with the ai coach is this Paralleling more or less the experience that you have, or did you have other expectations? Tell me about this. Oh, sure. Okay. So I'm, I'm still skeptical uh -huh. because um, the, a, a coach will often, as I understand, and I'm not a coach, but my perspective is that a, a coach is there to um, bounce ideas, be a mirror to you, to yeah. ask you questions for you to find answers. And when you use a um, AI assistant or an AI based coach, you know, it, it's spurting out questions to you in text format. And it just feels like question after question after question. But that's mm -hmm. exactly the conversation that you're having uh, vocally or, or verbally with a human. So it, it it might seem quite frustrating at first, but I, I've noticed it is learning from me. And it is using the information that I provide it to give me context based questions that are helping me uh, uh, look a bit deeper into the situations that I um, you know, pose to it. So, so wh what are you missing? Like if you compare the conversations that you have with your human coach and with the empathetic AI or with the AI coach that you use, what, what is it that you're missing? Because he's making questions too, right? The human coach. Sure, but I, I, I'm, I'm also seeing, like I am with you today, I'm seeing your emotions and micro gestures, uh -huh. uh, and your, your empathy, and I'm not, I'm not seeing the empathy when I'm chatting with, with um, an AI coach. So yeah. maybe I'm missing that human connection when you look into another person's eyes. Yeah, and you know they maybe they experience shock or sadness on your behalf, and then uh -huh. you see them become professional and they, um, you know they they focus you again. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. I mean, you see, I'm turning this into a customer interview. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we can yeah, we can have cool. our own coaching session afterwards no doubt um yeah. I, I i wonder about um your field how can our data community help in some way 
how can we help yeah, to like further it. this field yeah this is a uh, super interesting i think i mean we are working on social innovation uh, in general so we are always uh, this is like leo and i leo is my co-founder he's the cto and the ai whisperer in our company so we're we love just to look for the cases where we see okay here's a lot of suffering um there's no one taking care of these people how can we help um so th these we're looking for places where ai can uh, increase uh, social well-being in our society now obviously we would love to have um conversations with ai savvy people who join uh the discourse or who question us who give us feedback who maybe have their own develop and want to develop uh, their own idea and want to develop their own tool and are looking for someone to spare with to to develop this idea further so we're really looking for connection we're looking to put our heads together and exchange ideas and knowledge and get innovation going. This is how we want to, what we want to do. Um, mm. ha having said so, we, we are running a, a tech retreat this winter in January, February, where we are uh, pooling smart heads together for two weeks each. We're doing uh, three rounds and we will be flying to South Africa together <laughs> and spend there 14 days in a row to talk about things that we don't manage to do in our daily work environment so we want to crunch problems together that always get pushed aside or so this is part of what we want to do but we also want to work uh, we have like want to have a focused work hours where we're really getting stuff done and in the afternoons we want to connect on a different on a different level do some adventures in nature hiking canoeing paragliding just going to the beach and talking about our work in a different setting. So mm -hmm. having a variation of things. And we believe that having community with us, having smart brains with us will make it such a fruitful and intense time that we can really push forward a lot of our work, a lot of the work of the participants too, because it's you know, mutually beneficial uh, co-working. So um, mm. yeah. That is a, a, a yeah. That's fantastic. The tech retreat sounds amazing. Where can people find out more about the field of empathetic eye and also the work that you're doing? Um, obviously, I'm happy to connect on LinkedIn. Um, I'm posting there about empathetic AI. You can follow our company, Humanize, on the subject. Uh, check out our web page write me an email or write me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to, to exchange. Uh, yeah. Super. Nanette, all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for sharing. It's been a little bit of a different conversation, so I've really enjoyed it. A bit more human, I might say. Nice. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, cool. For, for any data enthusiasts who are curious about the topic, Nanette's let you know where you can reach out and please as we post this through the various channels uh, write your comments questions uh, and, and reach out uh, with interest cool thanks Nanette see you next time thank you for having me and I'm looking forward to having all your questions and comments and connects